Uh, before Argo, I was um, at Facebook working on something called Reagent. Uh, Reagent was a decision or is a decision making system. We made uh, something like over 100 billion decisions a day. Um, a lot of it was around marketing. Uh, we send coupons to advertisers. Um, we have all sorts of different marketing, like re-engagement, targeting, and all these things. Um, I worked on the core uh, kind of decision-making algorithm, and then we had something like 20 or 30 teams at Facebook that were using that. Um, every uh, year around December, I like to sort of really challenge myself. Um, I was uh, taking the bus, uh, you know, going from the office back home. And every time I would get on the bus or go home or change my Wi-Fi at all, I would lose all of my remote desktops. They would all close down. I'd have to reopen them. Super painful. I got tired of that. So I wrote an SSH replacement. Um, and uh, we have thousands of people using it, which is, which is pretty cool. So if you're using SSH, check out uh, Eternal Terminal, especially if you're IP roaming. Like, you know, all of my remote desktop connections are still running right now, even though I came to this building. So um, yeah, a bunch of other stuff. I worked on emulators. Uh, I got threatened by Nintendo. It was, I had to meet a guy in a Walmart parking lot. It was pretty scary. Um, but uh, I learned not to work on emulators for a little while and work on other things. So that I guess it worked. Uh, but uh, I also built the ML backend for Google uh, back in 2010 called Sybil. And so uh, we powered all the YouTube recommendations. So if you've ever been kind of sucked into a YouTube vortex, and all of a sudden you're like, wow, it's 4 a.m. and I'm still like watching videos on convex optimization, like that was our fault. So um, lastly, I have a podcast called Programming Throwdown. So definitely check it out. If you're new to programming, we have a lot of folks on the show, um, it's mostly an interview format. And we just let folks who have been in the industry a ton of time come in and talk. So what is Argo? Um, you know, Argo is, is a self-driving car company, and we'll dive into you know what it's all about, and then we'll dive into what uh, you know I'm trying to do there in this in this presentation. Um, you know, one of the things that really got me into this was that I have uh, two boys. Um, they're uh, they have a ton of hubris, like infinite hubris, and uh, um, you know they're relatively young. I mean, you have a nine year old and a three year old, but seven years from now. Um, my oldest one's going to be hitting the road, um, and we, uh, someone on my street lost his son, who is valedictorian of Westlake High School in, in a car accident, um, so, so it's, um, um, you know, it's something that's really real, it's the number one killer for, for children, you know, for young adults, and so that's what got me into it when I was kind of uh, done at Facebook, trying to find out what I wanted to do next, that's something that really hit home, um, and, uh, um, you know, and it's it's a tragic event, but it inspired me to kind of get into this field. And so I've been really enjoying it. I've been here for about a year. Um, it's also, you know, a good way to make money. So uh, uh, there's tons of people who need to get from A to B. There are a lot of things that need to get from A to B. As more people work from home, they need more things delivered to their home. So there's sort of like, uh, uh, you can't really lose there either. Um, and so the market opportunity is not going away and it's a stable, uh, you know, thing on the economic side as well. Um, one of the things that really interested me when I looked at Argo, as opposed to a lot of the other AV companies, was the tight hardware loop. So they have, a, a, you know, a really good partnership with the various car makers. And a lot of things that other companies might try and solve with AI which will work 99% of the time, not 100. Um, you know, Argo is able to solve with hardware. Um, it's also, you know, kind of a different kind of system than, than something like a Tesla. So, uh, you know, maybe a good way of putting it is, is um, you know, I, I drive like a cheap uh, Honda CRV that I bought forever ago and barely works, right? My son drives like a $270,000 car to school because he takes the bus, the school bus, right? And so, you know, that's what we want to do is build that service, build these vehicles that can do that kind of last mile delivery, run for a lot of time, take a lot of things and, and get efficiency that way. And so we're okay buying expensive LIDARs, expensive cameras, and you're building this for real. 
Um, this is really cool. I got to go to the test site where they shoot mud at things and they have robotic uh, people that cross the street and the car can like smash the person and, and they just put it back on the pedestal. Um, they have all sorts of different tests where they, uh, you know, they disable the computer at the worst possible time and they see what happens. Um, and so all that stuff was really, really interesting. I have zero robotics background coming into Argo. So it was, uh, it was really cool to see that side of things. And it's been really fun. Um, this is kind of uh, a view of the overall stack. Um, you know, it starts with kind of mapping and detection, you know, perception, all the computer vision, things that people would acutely, you know, associate with, with self-driving, right? Understanding the area and environment. Um, it goes from there to tracking and prediction. Tracking is actually surprisingly complex. So for example, we can actually, if you see just the nose of a you know, semi-tractor trailer, we can estimate the volume just because we've seen a lot of those and we kind of know what they look like, right? Um, and we know that on average, they have a trailer. You know, they don't have to, but so many of them do that we can infer that, right? Um, and so getting, you know, what they call monocular cuboids, you know, getting cuboids out of a, a, a detection is actually a really hard problem. There's a lot of machine learning that goes into that. Um, I think that that everyone knows how hard, you know, motion planning and control is. I mean, we've all been on the highway, all this sort of social signaling you have to do with the car, all the navigation through all different streets, a ton of optimization and interesting problems there as well. Um, one other interesting thing to note is that is that the input of each of these going down is the output, or sorry, the output of each of these is the input of the next one down. So in other words, you know, environment detection goes into tracking and prediction. And so that means that every time we retrain this model, everything downstream is affected. And so that is a, a massive problem. And we'll talk about how you know, AutoML helps with that. Uh, how about Autonomy ML, which is the org, uh, helps with that. Um, here's a cool picture of the, uh, the van system. Um, we have this uh, AVS, that's basically the computer. And then in the front, we have this CAVS, or we call it CAVS, which is the contingency computer. So imagine someone runs into us from behind, or this computer catches on fire, or I don't know, what kind of cosmic event can happen. This backup computer turns on kicks in and like can get the car to, to uh, pull over in the side of the road and things like that. So it's just programmed to do that one thing really well. A uh, whole bunch of sensors, as you see, it's, it's, there's just LIDARs all over the place, radars, IMUs. Um, these cost like these, these vehicles cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars each. So it's really meant to be a service that's running all day, you know, providing value. It's not meant to sit in a parking lot. Um, here's some cool pictures of the different uh, sensor modalities. A lot of people don't think about audio, but you do have to hear ambulances, you know, really, really important. So, uh, so if you have microphones on there, a lot of the other stuff is pretty canonical uh, robotics, right? Um, here's a video which might cause internet issues for folks uh, remote. I apologize for that, but this is a, a, just a cool video I found of... Uh, of uh, the car going through and navigating. It looks like it's having issues for us too, but, uh, but you'll get an idea of the, uh, it's actually not a slideshow in real life. When we don't run at like two Hertz, that would be a problem, um, but you can kind of see the different, uh, uh, and if folks want to afterwards, you can come on up and I'll show you the video on my laptop. Um, we do a lot of the you know object segmentation we also do sensor fusion. So we might see somebody in LIDAR before we see them in image processing. And if we can get a signature that way, when we get the image data, we'll kind of stitch it all together. And we'll say, okay, this, or we might see a really large radar signature and say, okay, well, that must be a car. It's too big to be something else. We can know that in advance. And then we can use all of them as sort of priors against each other and kind of like a block, um, block relaxation type thing. Um, so yeah, here's another video. I think I'll I'll skip it for now. 
Um, but it's kind of showing the same kind of thing. I have those different sensors. And when you put them together, you can navigate some really complicated environments. Um, lastly, you know, there's a lot of us uh, researchers at Argo. So we're, um, we have a really cool thing called Argoverse that I'm a part of where we put out a data set and we have open challenges. Um, and so anybody who's familiar with Python can go in, you know, see some of the top uh, uh, submissions and uh, also, you know, submit your own solution, make variations on the, the winner and try and do better in all of them. Okay, so that is a lot of the corporate talk. I'm not like a suit. I've never been really good at that, but hopefully I was able to channel that pretty well. Um, so now we'll get to sort of the nitty gritty of what is um, autonomy ML infrastructure. I purposely called the org auto ML to be confusing because I thought that would be clever. So we are basically three things. We're an application layer that kind of sits in between a lot of the cloud platform and the autonomy engineers, right? That's, you know, in practice what we are, that's sort of our code footprint, right? Um, how we do that is through a set of services and libraries that people can access. So instead of some folks, you know, let's say writing, uh, you know, creating a Kubernetes job by hand, um, they can use our platform Picasso and it just abstracts a lot of that and makes it a lot easier. Um, and the reason why we need an org like this is because you need to have a hybrid org of folks who really get machine learning, but also understand how to build big systems. We found that in practice, the chasm is just too large. When you have sort of the folks who are really good at big systems, Kubernetes, EKS, all the stuff. And then all the way in the other end of the org chart, you have you know, the research scientists. What ends up happening is the research scientists end up building this organization themselves anyways. And so like, let's make it formal. Let's have a, a centralization. Let's, let's take advantage of an economy of scale. So we're not reinventing the wheel all the time. We can build something really beautiful. And uh, that's what I came here a year ago to stand up. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things we're responsible for, like for example, the, the tensor board uh, and the TensorFlow runtime on the car and all of that. Um, but I've set kind of two high level goals for AutoML, uh, you know, in the next, over the next uh, 12 months or so. And the first is efficiency, you know, we want, Folks, and that's that's really efficiency on the people side, on the engineering side. And then also the second goal is reliability. And I'll dive into both of those. So this is a picture of uh, somebody mopping the iRobot store surrounded by robot mops, right? And the reason why this is what it is is because it's just way more efficient, right? Imagine if you had to have you know, I think they're called scubas or I don't know, Brava jets or something. You have to have these iRobot mops, you know, do a whole mall, right? You need hundreds of them. They break down all the time. They have to live in the mall. And it's just much easier to just pay this one person to just come uh, once a week and mop the mall. So you end up with like, like ludicrous pictures like this, right? Um, and so I think efficiency is extremely, extremely important as long as you're talking about developer efficiency. People get really hung up on you know, how can I like eke this 1% out of this, you know, training Python code? And that's fine, but, but the broader thing is, you know, what are engineers and scientists spending their time doing? You know, what is like, what is Omdahl's law? Like, what is the biggest thing they're spending their time doing? A lot of it is data management. Um, a lot of it is running simulations and trying to do validation. And so we wanna make sure we make all of those processes as efficient as possible. The reason why that's important is I call this sort of the research scientist staircase. And you get these uh, points of discontinuity when you get tighter and tighter iteration cycles. Um, so we saw this at Google years and years ago when Dremel became really popular. So before that, people would you know, submit a query to get some kind of statistics from some ads uh, service, and they'd wait you know, hours and they'd get their result. Then Dremel came out, and people could just write queries almost instantly. And that really radically changed uh, the product. Um, people could iterate much quicker. They were inspired. They could, they could try random things. Um, they could get feedback you know, almost instantaneously. And it was really powerful. And so there, there is a, a huge leap when you can go from weeks to days 
days to hours, hours to minutes. And that's, you know, developer time, right? But, you know, running counter to that, you know, a guardrail on this is that the model size really matters and training time also really matters. So the longer you train, the bigger the model is, the better the result. And so that goes completely counter to what we wanted in the previous slide. And so we have to find some way to trade these two things off. Um, Rich Sutton's famous for talking about the, this article, The Bitter Lesson, where I don't know how many uh, reinforcement learning or policy optimization folks, but you know, there's a period of time, like you know, after IBM beat Kasparov and all of that, where people were looking for really clever ways to do search and do branch and bound, and oh, can we find this type of bound and this heuristic and that? And none of that mattered, right? In image processing, we were doing all these Gabor filters and all these clever ways to do filtering and make the problem linear. None of that matters. It's just deep nets can run on tons of machines with tons of data and blow that away, right? Like MCTS um, um, you know, and other sort of approaches just destroyed everyone else at computer go just because they were computationally way more tractable, right? And, and you saw this even with OpenAI. So with OpenAI's Dota player, um, you know, their Dota player takes uh, uh, 300 years of Dota games every day. And at that scale, they were able to create an expert player using like DQN and, and other methods that, um, you know, are relatively simple, have been around for a long time. So how do we balance these things? How do we get the big training time, all of that, with, um, you know, that fast iteration loop? And the answer is through a lot of pipeline. And so... Um, we build a bunch of systems that allow us to iterate really quickly when we want to, and then also switch over to large scale when we're ready to, and then go back to iterating quickly when we want to go back into research mode. So this is some kind of really concrete examples of things that you know my teams have built that have you know accelerated a lot of development. So. This is very low level, but it's amazing how powerful it is. It's just replacing Pathlib with something that can handle the cloud. So um, for folks who know Python, I'm sure you've seen Pathlib. You're going to delete a file, search a directory, um, you know, see how many files are in a directory, all of that stuff. You could use Pathlib. Um, but if you want to see what files are in a data lake um, you know, or how many terabytes of logs you have sitting in the cloud, you can't use Pathlib directly. So we created a nice wrapper around uh, the library that Dask and Pandas use so that now you can do anything with Pathlib you can do uh, in the cloud as well. And so now developers who are training models on their desktop, they can just change in the configuration file where they're loading their data from. We'll put that data on the cloud, change the configuration to point at that, new place on the cloud and now they can run on the cloud and so we at least using this we got people from mm -hmm. running on one node on their desktop to running on one node in the cloud without any effort on their part and that ended up being really nice because now people could spin up three or four or five ec2 instances instances and run this three or four or five times so it's, it's moving people in the right direction at, with a very very low friction point um, another thing we built, which is going to be a little bit more um, technical, is a cloud map. Not to be confused with Amazon cloud map, which is actually a really terrible product. That has nothing to do with this. Um, so the way, what this cloud map is all about is how many people have used map, like the Python map function? Okay, cool. How many people have used multiprocessing, that import multiprocessing? Okay, good. So we have about maybe 70% of the people. So you, know, you can do this thing called multiprocessing.pool.map, and it will go on all the cores of your machine and execute some function uh, you know, as quickly as it can, as many times, with whatever parallelism you give it. So you might give something a million inputs and say, run this function a million times, use as much of my computer as you can, just get it done, and it will go off and do that. Um, we built something that lets you do that on the cloud. Um, and it'll actually switch between running on multiprocessing or running on the cloud. Um, the way that works is we actually package your application into a Docker image, ship that Docker image up to the cloud, and then we have a 
little shim in that image that can execute any global function arbitrarily, which would be super dangerous if you were giving it to a random person, but we are, we're all employees, so it works out. Um, then your main function says, uh, you know, call, I wanna call this a million times, I'll make a million requests to Slurm or Batch, or we have our own internal thing called Jobs Platform. Um, you could do this with Lambda, uh, and it will just, again, process that as quickly as it can, but now it's on the cloud. So as long as your input and output parameters aren't too big, um, it runs extremely efficiently. And this ended up being a, a huge, huge improvement because we were able to just go through, find all the maps at, in the code base and replace them with this. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, that's, this was a, a huge win for us. So this is examples of how, you know, kind of some clever coding is able to really take people up in that valence up to the next level where things that were taking days are now taking hours, right? Um, reliability is extremely difficult, right? So, you know, there is the, the sort of coding reliability part, right? So making sure there aren't errors in the code, CI, CD type stuff, and that's fine. But reliability on the modeling side is really, really difficult. So how do you know that you didn't introduce some bad behavior in a situation that we don't have any logs for? Because we've never had to worry about it before, right? These are really hard questions to answer. And so uh, a bunch of folks on my team are, are you know, constantly iterating on that. Um, this is by far the most prevalent tool that we have at our disposal. It's called Play Forward. And so the idea here is um, it's kind of like a simulator, but if we were to just take a situation, let's say we have some situation we're not happy with. So this one, for example, um, the car didn't stop soon enough for a bicyclist who is non-compliant, who is a bicycle is basically uh, jaywalked or jay bicycled or something. And we, uh, and we just didn't see them fast enough. We weren't happy with it. I mean, we saw them, we slammed on the brakes, but we, we wanted to do better. So this, um, I know it's kind of hard to read because the internal tool, but basically what's going on here is this gray thing here is the AV in that log. So it was moving, you know, left to right. And uh, these kind of weird sort of spectrums here, these are other actors. So red means they were just there. Yellow means they were there a while ago. And so you see these people are leaving these kind of light trails, right? Um, and you can't actually see the bicycle because I kind of cut it off, but this is bicyclists. Actually, bicycles aren't on this particular image, I guess, but bic this bicyclist is coming on right there. And what we do here is we start off in an open loop simulator, which means we're running the car through kind of replaying this log with all these events and these people are doing what they were doing and we're doing what we were doing. And at some point we switch it and we say, okay, the AV now has, has, I was gonna say autonomy, but, but now the AV can sort of change the world. It, it can sort of redirect what it was going to do. Um, but everyone else is still on rails. They're still doing what they would have done in the log. The AV is able to do anything. And so when we do this with new software, you get this ghost car here, this little green car here. And that one is noticing the bicycle earlier and slowing down. Um, so that's good, right? In this image, it's showing that we've done something good. Um, you can imagine those situations where this gets really hard. Like for example, what if right here, there's somebody you know, turning onto the road past us in the log? So let's say in the log, a person just went like this, right? And they, they drove to where that ghost car is. Well, now, in our, in our simulation, they just drove right through us. They just crashed right into us, right? But that's not realistic, right? We know that, that we're almost certain that if we were really doing what this ghost car is doing, that car would have waited for us. So you have all these really odd effects where people are totally irrational because they're reacting to a car that doesn't exist anymore. Does that make sense? It's a little bit kind of matrixy. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, Super hard problem. We have uh, folks working on this. Um, I think it's fascinating, a really, really interesting problem. And I could spend a whole hour talking about how uh, you know, we deal with things like that. 
Um, but it's uh, it's I think super interesting and really fun. Um, another challenge is how do you search through all of this data, right? The vast majority of the time, there's nothing interesting happening. The car is driving on the road. It's made whatever decisions it needs to have made, and it's just cruising along. It stopped at a red light. It's in the garage, right? And and you know how do you you know log what is interesting? What does it even mean for something to be interesting? Right? These are uh, really fundamental challenges that touch the entire stack and require a lot of cognitive overhead, right? If you think that, uh, you know, left turns are really interesting now, but only if there's, you know, a scooter that's going in front of the car, well, then, like, it turns out you have to write three different languages to, like, get a data set like that. And, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out how we can uh, make that easier. You know, we have some ideas around having the car send uh, we call embeddings, but send sort of projections of the data to the cloud and the cloud will decide if we should log. Uh, there's a lot of clever ideas there, um, but that's a fundamental problem. And it's an open question. The whole uh, AV industry has this problem. And as I mentioned earlier, there's tons of what we call distribution shift, which means the state of the universe is not like it was yesterday. It's changed in some fundamental way. And so we have to catch that. So for example, I'll give you an example. Um, our traffic light detector got better, but our perception system was kind of compensating for the bad traffic light detector. And those compensations ended up becoming extremely degenerate when the traffic light detector was accurate because it kept looking for errors in the traffic light that weren't there anymore. And then when it didn't see them, it just kind of flipped out. So that's like an example. And so then you have to go back to the traffic light team and say, hey, you know, make your traffic light detector worse. I don't like the new one, right? And it's just really, it's just odd, right? So, um, so what we want to do is catch all of these things really, really quickly. As you know, if you find a bug uh, in that bug, you know, maybe you imagine like Eternal Terminal. I right? I built Eternal Terminal years ago. If I didn't have CI/CD, it would be dead. It would be a dead project because I would get a bug now and I'd have no idea how to fix it. Right? It's only because of CI/CD that bugs are so small and incremental that I can get enough context to go in and fix it. Um, and so we want to do that, but on the mathematical side. And we're going to do that through a lot of anomaly detection and uh, a really nerdy version of Clippy. So um, we're going to put anomaly detection on the features, on the loss. We're going to put it on the metrics. Um, some of these things don't have very clear uh, geometry, so it's not obvious how to do anomaly detection. A lot of open problems there. Um, but we're going to solve those problems, and then we're going to give people reports about how their model is doing. And if we see something really wild, we can let people know in advance. Um, ultimately, we want the models to tell the engineers when something's wrong. And uh, that's our plan for the next quarter or so. And we need help. You know, We need a lot of people who uh, can help out with this. Primary, uh, Python is the primary language for my whole org. Um, the vast majority of what we do is Python. Um, and uh, you know, we're always looking for uh, more talented people who can come in and, and help us uh, you know, make progress in this area. Um, we have an Austin office. So uh, um, you know, there is a physical place where you can go and, and spend time and focus. We also have a ton of people working from home. Uh, as I said kind of earlier, you know, alluded to, I feel like this is the sort of space race of our generation. So if your, you know, parents or uncles or if your your relatives, you know, actually worked on the rockets back in the day or or anything like that, I mean, this is sort of our generation's chance to kind of step up and uh, uh, do you know our uh, our our part to kind of uh, get these uh, robots on the road. I think it's as I said, number one killer, and uh, uh, you know, super important. Um, I also like that this is not really a side project. You know, we're not. Um, owned by another company, or this isn't, we're not trying to sell a car, and if it has autonomy, that's great. I mean, we're committed to autonomy. That is the business. Um, we don't make cars. Um, there's no sort of alternative. Um, you know, we want to move things and people around using robots. 
that's what the company is. That's what's always going to be. Um, it's a tough time. I would uh, be lying if I told you that we have tons of recs open and I have all the recs that I did uh, three months ago. That would be a bald faced lie. Um, it is a hard time for everybody. Um, I think it's a very short, temporary hard time. That's my personal opinion. I, I have known to be uh, too optimistic, uh, so I'll, I'll eat that. I might be eating crow on that, um, but I think it's short term. Either way, you know, the important thing is to stay strong. I know, you know, looking around, there's folks who have been through the 2007, this, uh, perhaps folks who have been through the, the 2000 and 2001, you know, dot-com crash, and we've all seen kind of ups and downs. Uh, there was COVID, there was a big downturn, you know, in COVID, and just stay strong, persevere, um, you know, definitely, I'd love to get uh, your resumes, check out the careers page, do all of that. Um, there are uh, positions open. Um, I hope there will be a lot more positions open in a few months. Uh, but either way, no matter what happens, general advice is, you know, these are tough times, and the people who kind of stay strong in these tough times will always uh, uh, will go on to, to do really great things. I know, uh, um, you know it can be sort of heartbreaking, you know, these kind of times. We've seen tons of posts on LinkedIn of uh, people, you know, uh, you know, going through really tough times. But, uh, um, but uh, you know, I feel like we've always come across, come out of it much better than we went into it. And so I'm looking forward for the light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's gonna be here really quickly. And yeah, we're not going to send you a 10 hour take home to us. Um, cool. So that's uh, what I have. And uh, yeah, I think we have time for a few questions before. So, yeah. so the first question is, um, this is, is this like a space race where you once you get to the moon, you're done? I'm, I'm thinking it's not, that you'll be iterating and improving for, for decades after. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, um, no, you're definitely right. So we have an uh, operating domain. And so... Um, because we're a service, we, we want to partner with people who already move things and just make it cheaper and more efficient. So for example, we have a partnership with Lyft. So I actually took a Lyft robot car here. I mean, it's an Argo car, but I used the Lyft app to have a robot car pick me up and take me here. Um, Lyft can take me with a person just as easily, right? And so for that reason, we can be selective about what areas we want to focus on. Um, and so, for example, a good example of that is um, if it snows. So we operate in Pittsburgh. That's one of the cities we work at. If it snows, we just shut down. And now maybe one day we'll be able to handle that, but it's not today. If it snows, we shut down. And, you know, fortunately, Lyft can still take people because there's their Lyft, right? So, so you're right. The operating domain will continue. And I actually think at some point, it's, it's like the iRobot photo of the lady pushing the mop. At some point, like, it's probably not worth it for a self-driving car to take me to a campsite, right? Because it happens so infrequently, the roads are so odd and it's such a long tail. And so, so yeah, my guess is it'll just slowly creep up uh, on those places. But in the meantime, we want to sort of capture the core value and different companies are capturing it in different niches. Our niches is, is downtown. Uh, yeah, go go ahead. Maybe in the back, you raised your hand a little earlier. Yeah, so um, I don't quite understand the business model behind Argo. Mm -hmm. Sounds to me like you're mostly doing research on uh, self-driving. Like Jason, please repeat the question so we can hear yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, I'll so I'll give it. You oh yeah, sure. There's a request from the chat that people can't hear. The ah, okay. So the Perfect. yeah. So the question is, what is Argo's business model? You know, are we kind of a research lab? Um, and so I'll I'll tell you very clearly the use case, right? So Lyft uh, gets a request from somebody who needs to go from A to B. Lyft sends that request to us and says, Argo, can you take this person? And if we say yes, then we do it. We go, we pick that person up. We drop them off with one of our cars, like our capital, right? If we say no, then Lyft uses their own cars. And so that's that's the business model. And so we have you know, partnerships with Lyft, with Walmart. Um, we have a bunch of partnerships, I can't say, but, but basically you know, those companies ask us, can you go from A to B? 
And if we can't do it, they, we, we, I mean, part of the deal is they need to have some way of, of falling back if we can't, if we can't do it. And, and maybe one day we'll have a, have a whole fleet of human driven vehicles as well. But at the moment, we're only partnering with people who could really do it themselves or are trying to save costs. Is it cheaper for them? Yeah, good question. So, um, oh yeah, the question is, is it cheaper for them to use our car? So yes, it's cheaper for them, uh, you know, because we're still early, right? They're early adopters, like any early adopter in, in B2B, you know, you get some nice advantages, right? But I mean, long-term would be cheaper for them. Yeah, long-term, um, you know, we'll be fully driverless. And so the trade-off becomes, you know, the, the OPEX cost of all these fancy LIDARs and cameras and everything versus, or sorry, the CAPEX cost versus the OPEX cost of the driver, right? And so, you know, when we hit that crossover point, um, then, uh, uh, then it, will, it will be profitable for them, right? And so we'll hit that crossover point we don't need too much saturation at that crossover point. Drivers are pretty expensive. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead. All right, we have oh, and you're next. Yeah. Uh, you can go first if you want to, but yeah. <laughs> sorry. Are, are you able to work with, you, you mentioned having your own cars. Are you able to work with different types of vehicles, such as trucks, buses, vans, or are you only able to work with you know, standard, like small cars or sedans? Yeah, it's a good question. The question was, um, you know, can we only work with sedans or can we work with other types of vehicles? Um, yeah, we actually have a, a full-size van that we have all of our compute on. Um, so yeah, spinning up a new, uh, we've spun up a couple of prototype platforms too, and it's been relatively frictionless. I mean, you have to retrain all the models and everything, but, um, but it hasn't been anything, uh, you know, any real roadblocks there. Yeah, go ahead. Well, my question is, you have like these ensembles of models with like the graphic light one, but then they all just like feed into one, like, uh, you know, how does that get, like how many models do you have? Like, yeah, it's a good question. Or, how many models? Big thing, or? Yeah, so the question is sort of how many models and how does that ensemble work, right? Um, there are, I would say on the order of 30 or 40 models, um, you know, some of them are very specific, like the siren detection, for example, is, is its own thing, right? Um, you know, others are form sort of causal chains. So, so like, uh, you know, the image processing goes into prediction, et cetera. Um, and uh, um, yeah, and so you end up playing this sort of dance where all the models are updating at different cadences. And so we're, every night, you know, we're running a full end-to-end -end um, um, job, which is running thousands and thousands of simulations and these sort of counterfactual, these, these play forward simulation, and then looking at anomalies and differences. But yeah, we're constantly finding issues, integration issues, you know, issues between models that then we're reporting back. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's do one from the chat. Oh yeah, sure. Um, so the question here is how does an autonomous car keep from running into a biker or a pedestrian or a pet? Or a pet. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's a good question. I think the, the, um, actually, could people hear you when you just asked that? I don't. Okay. So don't. the question you is, uh, to it though, they can all see the chat. And then the yeah. follow-up sentence is what software and hardware is, uh, involved to determine that. And somebody says they can hear me. So, I'm okay. Oh, okay. okay. All right, cool. So, um, right. So Argo has, uh, you know, the, if you see in the picture here, you can definitely see the sort of big LIDAR that sort of UFO looking thing on the top of the car. But also if you look at the bottom, we call these near field, um, we're, uh, right below the headlights. We have near field cameras and LIDARs all over the car. And so, um, you know, we can solve a lot with hardware that otherwise would require some incredibly complicated AI. Like, because we have a LIDAR, two LIDARs right at the front of the car, like there's no reason, there's no AI needed to not hit something that's stationary. So we can just cross that right off the list. If something's stationary, we can just use engineering to not hit it, right, and, and hardware. Um, um, yeah, things that are smaller, yeah, I have some slides that I skipped, but you can find them on the Argo website. Our LiDAR is incredibly expensive, and, and, and we also, we, we make our own LiDAR, we invented a new type of LiDAR, and uh, it's incredibly high resolution. Um, so, 
So that I think you know helps tremendously. Um, we tag everything. So so you know pedestrians. You know we have a special classifier for them. We have a classifier for pets. Um, we have uh, pets on bicycles. You know we have all sorts of classifiers. So we've we've seen it all. Um, um, and uh, that's that's really how uh, we avoid all of these things. Yeah. So you mentioned kind of bridging the gap between data science and engineering, uh, and you kind of run the tools for like a DX. Right? Mm -hmm. What was the like? Which what's the team size where you need that, or what's going to be the ratio of engineers to DX tools? Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, so the question is, you know, when do you need kind of a, an infrastructure org, right? Um, it's, it's a good question. I, I think that it's it's hard to know for sure. I, I think one way to look at it is how much redundancy do you have and, and what are you getting out of that redundancy? The second thing is how many complaints are you getting? So for example, um, I, I won't say the team, but there was a team at a, another you know place I used to work at where you know they had people with PhDs in AI that were on call. And so they were spending 70% of their time on call. And finally, they would just quit, quit that team because they're like, this is, you know, I don't want to do this. Not what I, uh, 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 you know, it's not my strength. Right. And so at some point, you know, you get an economy of scale there. Uh, and you also get a need to really optimize um, some of those tools. Like Tensor, the TensorFlow is a good example where for a long time, one of the engineers, in the autonomy or just maintain TensorFlow on the vehicle. Um, but that's not really their, their uh, strength, right? They're not really interested in that. And so that accumulates over time. Eventually someone, so you can, I think a good way to know if you need a infrastructure org is just to measure the distribution of time that your scientists and engineers are, are, uh, are spending and what they're spending it on. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I think you could talk about uh, managing complexity either at the software or system level. So it seems like a, a lot of a lot of what you're doing, uh, for example, with the ensemble, it's like I, I could easily see a scenario where you're adding new models, and each new model improves the performance, but you, you have so many that the complexity becomes unmanageable. So I was wondering if you can talk about the tools you use for managing complexity at, at the system or software level. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the question is, how do you manage this sort of combinatorial complexity of all these models that can interact with each other? Um, one of the things that we did early on when I joined was we we set a I set a mandate that every model um, that is actually on the car, so every let's call it production model, needs to be retrained on the cloud periodically. And so at the time, there were models that were on the car that had been trained on somebody's desktop, and then that person had quit. And so, you know, it's like we had to like see if the code was still there on their desktop. So, so you know, the first thing I said is, okay, let's make every model trained on the cloud. It has a Git, uh, uh, you know, uh, hash associated with it, so we can retrain it whenever we want. Let's make sure the data on the production models has infinite retention, right? And let's get everything kind of all the lineage tracking in place, right? Um, and so, yeah, I feel like the complexity is, um, was grinding, you know, a lot of folks to a halt because they, they were just having to spend so much cognitive overhead on managing, you know, may, they might have inherited or built three models and just managing that became a full-time job or part-time job. And so over time, we're, we're starting to, to, you know, remove that burden. Uh, yeah. So like, uh, the, the cars themselves, right? Like. They have a dedicated computer, right? Mm -hmm. Systems are running. Um, and you mentioned that uh, you also do some cloud computing, right? Right. So, is that is there some kind of trade off where you do more cloud computing, so you decrease the computational power of the uh, your system in, on the car, or? Ah, yeah. No, so, so the the car isn't learning. So whatever's on the car, it's already learned. And so it's just executing what it learned in the cloud. Yeah, so, so there, there's, the car isn't like uh, asking the cloud for advice, like should I turn left or whatever? I mean, all the AI is there on the car, but, it, but it's being updated in the cloud and then pushed to the car at some cadence. I might have 
just for you there. I thought you said you, that some training does take place on the in the computer system on the car, or did I hear that correctly? Um, no, I mean, the one thing that happens on the car is the, the car's response. So, okay, so imagine like a, a YouTube video, let's say a, a minute long YouTube video is what, 12 meg or something, right? And so that's just one camera is creating, let's say 12 megs a minute, right? And it's actually way more than that because it's the cameras are really high fidelity. So let's say a hundred megs a minute. And then we have, I don't know, like 16 cameras. We have LIDARs that are like 360 degree, right? So it's generating an insane amount of data. Um, even if we had enough hard drive space to log it all, we don't have enough time to look at it all, right? Not even with a computer, right? And so, we need to have AI on the car that decides whether something's interesting or not. And that's where um, you know, we're doing some adaptive learning on the vehicle. So it's not changing the behavior, but it's figuring out, is this interesting? Should I save this to the hard drive or not? Yeah. I mean, if you were gonna upload it or something, if it said like, you were gonna be doing upload file. Kind of, yeah, you're on the right track. Basically, if it's interesting, it saves to disk. And then whenever that car is done for the day, uh, it someone literally plugs an Ethernet cable into it. So yeah, uh, maybe we'll take one from the chat because I don't want to neglect the the chat if uh, there is one. See any? Oh okay. All right. Yeah, we'll we'll keep I going. A very short one. I mean, sure. How to power all those devices because you have like sensors, lidar, X and Y. How much energy do you need? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's it, you know we can't actually run this on a combustion pure combustion engine car. It has to be either a hybrid or an electric car. Mm -hmm. And so I think in this case, all our cars are electric, I think. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you're right. It takes huge amperage, huge amperage to run all of these things. So, so we need a big battery and cars, you know, along with the Ethernet cable, they get the, the, the EV plug as well. There is actually a question from the chat that it scrolled off the top and I missed ah. it. Um, someone is asking if you would clarify what Clippy was supposed to do in your demo. Oh, Clippy. Yeah. So, so, uh, so the question is, what is, uh, what is Clippy in the demo? So this is, this goes way back. Actually, maybe it's just not relevant anymore, but Microsoft Clippy was this incredibly annoying thing that popped up right when I was around high school. Um, and, uh, uh, I would be writing my like high school, you know, some, some research or some uh, research, but some, uh, high school paper on the you account know, of Monte Cristo or something. And Clippy would pop up and say, Hey, you know, I think, I could help you with what you're writing or, Hey, I think you're, you're trying to like delete this thing that you're working on and shut down your computer. I'm like, what? And it was just super annoying and annoyed everybody. So tons of people turned off. And so, um, um, you know, what we want to do is, is proactively alert people when their model has degenerated. Right. And so, uh, Clippy is, is expressly the user experience we don't want. Uh, but I'm just kind of poking fun at the bear there. Um, but yeah, I, I think the 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 um, if we get it right, it'll be a something that people are actually really happy to receive because what people get right now is, you know, someone maybe even our CTO. Our CTO has literally, you know, kind of reached out to people and said, "Hey, I noticed your model is, you know, three months old. You should probably retrain it." Like our CTO will actually do that, and then that person gets super nervous, and then they go to retrain it, and it sucks, <laughs> and then they flip out, right? And so, you know, we don't want to do that. So we want to be retraining these models all the time and catch things right away. And uh, yeah, we won't use Clippy, but we'll have probably a Slack bot <laughs> that will just ping a person and say, hey, here's a list of anomalies in your model today. Maybe it's way better. And maybe you expected that because you have a change, but you know, here's the data anyways. We probably need to wrap up in a, in a few minutes. Here. Sure. Uh, there's a, another question here from the chat and maybe one more from the room. So J Jacob is actually asking about the, are you familiar with the concept of a trolley problem? Yeah, uh, yeah. About, uh, the ethical decisions the car has to make where it has to, you know, in real time decide to crash into the school bus or crash into the river, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that's come up a lot. I think that uh, it's really interesting. You can go on the web and look up trolley problem and there's all these ethical things like you crash into the black hole, which causes you into another universe to kill somebody, or do you crash into the person right now? All these weird things. Um, no, I think that you know our, our contingency system, when it kicks in, just like emergency stops the car. And so if we end up in a situation where we have to hit like a dog or a cat, the car will just emergency slam on the brakes. 
the other thing is people don't realize this, but we can slow down. Like a car in general can slow down. And I think it's like six meters per second squared, which will actually throw you through the windshield almost if you're not wearing a seatbelt. And so the car, like, you know, if, especially if you optimize the brake, if it's not a human breaking it, but a machine breaking it, this car can stop really, really damn fast, right? So maybe the question is really like, should you like smash your head against the windshield or like hit a person? I don't know. I mean, you could think about a lot of these hypotheticals um, in practice especially when you're driving on low speeds in urban areas, you really don't have a lot to worry about. Um, we've actually never had an accident. I mean, fingers crossed, you know, knock on whatever this is. But, um, you know, we've, we've been carrying people all over Miami and Austin. We've had tons of successful trips. Um, our biggest complaint from moving people around is that there's no luggage space because the whole trunk is a giant computer. Um, we have 4.9 stars. Our fake driver, you could actually look him up on Lyft, has 4.9 stars. Um, and yeah, we haven't had to worry too much about like really crazy things like that. Uh, I'm sure there's people thinking about that, but hasn't know that doing yeah. So actually, it if, actually if uh, yeah, so you know, we haven't announced this yet. So like, I don't really know, but but it's like a dark launch. Uh, but you can between the hours of one and six p.m. You can request a lift within downtown Austin, and there's a chance you'll get, and it'll actually say self-driving. You still have to pay the same amount, but it'll say self-driving. So, yeah. Okay, one more question for Ruth. Thanks. Did you have to build some sort of integration with Lyft, for example, like we integrate with their API so they yeah. can actually communicate with you? But that's I guess you have like an old team doing some. Yeah, sort of it's a lot of Python. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's not my team, but yeah, that's someone had to build all of that back in. Yeah. Uh, why are you using traditional cars then? Why don't you also design the cars? Yeah, so this is a custom car. So it, it has a, a Ford Escape chassis, but everything else is, is custom. Um, now, like, yeah, I was going to say, like, you could, you know, maybe be even more exotic and do, like, uh, like get rid of uh, maybe the gap between the seats. Like, like yeah, like, you know, uh, we do have vans as well. I didn't have too many pictures of them. But, uh, uh, you know, one thing about the more you leave it similar to an existing car, the easier it is for the assembly line to turn them out. Um, so that is one kind of factor. But I think in the long term, I think they'll start to look radically different. I think that's on the horizon. All right, I think we need to wrap up. Okay, so, I want to give time to the next person. Thank so. you for the presentation. That was awesome. Cool. cool. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody, online. So and so, we'll take a minute. Uh, we'll bring it up to everybody who wants to eat. Back. Um, what would it be? All the plays at home? I took one today. So it's today. <laughs> I've seen the exact same vehicle. But there was actually a person driving in the driver's